Welcome to Al Hakam Inspire. Today we're very honored to have Dr. Atar Naveed Malik, who is a neuroscientist and chief resident physician in neurosurgery at Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. He obtained his PhD and postdoc research in neurobiology from Harvard and is also part of Muslim Scientists, which is a body of the Ahmadi Muslim Community USA, which focuses on bringing the new Islamic golden age of science, God willing. So, Dr. Atil, thank you for joining us and welcome. Thank you, Jazakallah, and peace be upon you. And I'm excited to chat with you today. As a disclaimer, Al Hakam Inspire does not advise the implementation of any specific conclusion from today's episode. During the podcast, we present ideas and research on the topic and surrounding areas. The aim of the podcast is to provide an enjoyable experience of knowledge acquisition, exploring current research and future ideas, and reflecting on the spiritual and Islamic traditions where applicable. Now, let's talk a little bit about the the brain. So, what are brain circuits and how do they work and sort of in terms of of development of of uh sort of child development um how important is it to develop these brain circuits early on or, or can they be developed at any age so the brain uh is uh you know the part of the nervous system that we think a lot about and you can think of the brain almost as a computer that's processing information constantly uh, as it relates to your body and your environment. And circuits in the brain are really like the wires in the computer that are communicating that information. Now those circuits, amazingly, they're not made of they're not made of metal the way we think of a computer wire. They're actually made up of biological uh, substances. They're made up of cells and they're made up of uh, neurons with their axons and dendrites that form these connections with one another. And because of that, uh, the circuits in our brain have the amazing ability to adapt uh, to different experiences, different environments, uh, and different situations. And that relates to your question about how these circuits develop and whether they develop early on or they can develop later and what scientists now understand is that there's a kind of a hardwired initial development of the nervous system that happens that's based on the genetics of uh, an organism. You know, in our case, our genes dictate the initial development of the nervous system. But the subsequent refinement of neural circuits occurs with experience. And here there's a critical role for the experiences that we have that shape our nervous system. Now, this was actually initially discovered by Hubel and Weasel, who are two scientists at Harvard Medical School, who discovered that if you take an animal and you sew one of its eyes shut, uh, the animal will actually become blind because it, the animal loses the visual experience uh, dependent refinement of its neural circuitry, and it actually loses vision as a result of that. So that was kind of the first demonstration that uh, experience played such a critical role in the development of neural circuits. Now, Hubel and Weasel actually, they won the Nobel Prize for these discoveries um, because they were so seminal in our understanding of the nervous system. But it showed that, you know, these early experiences are actually quite critical. Um, What we've learned since then is that it's not only those early experiences that you have um, perhaps as a child, but really experiences throughout your life continue to modify the nervous system uh, in, in very interesting ways. And, and so there's actually a fundamental relationship between the experiences that we have as individuals and our neural circuits. They're constantly evolving in response to those experiences. Do, do you mean by those experiences, is it... Um what we experience as individuals um, physically, like is, is, does diet play a role? Does, is it like a wide range or is it one specific kind of area that changes the brain or is it multifaceted? It's actually everything, you know, everything you can think of. Um, It's, it's, you know, what you eat, it's how you live, it's how you, what your schedule is like. 
uh, you know, whether you have a normal regular schedule or an irregular schedule, it's uh, the activities that you uh, participate in. Uh, it's the thoughts that you have. I well, mean, every time, thoughts. exactly. I mean, every time we do anything, we're activating part of our nervous system. And so whatever you're doing is actually changing some part of your nervous system as you do it. And so if you reinforce certain behaviors, it'll change your nervous system accordingly. And if you actually stop performing certain behaviors, it would change your nervous system in a different way. So you can think of it that every single action that you have impacts your nervous system. And that actually influences perhaps your future behaviors um, in a way that's not linear. It's not a one-to-one -one thing, uh, but you can think of kind of all of our actions as having some influence on our nervous system just and our kind brain. Of go <clears throat> just kind of going on from that, can you explain this whole hype, especially in these um, days about neuroplasticity? Everyone's talking about it. Everyone's like, we want neuroplasticity. What does it mean? Um, how can we achieve it? And, you know, tell us the reality about this. So neuroplasticity is a fancy word, but it, what it basically means is that the brain can adapt with experience. And, you know, people might be excited about that idea because it is linked with certain phenomena such as learning or memory. Um, I and mean, the reality is that we all have neural plasticity. This is a fundamental uh, feature of the nervous system. It's a fundamental feature of the brain that, as I mentioned, it's a biological system that God has created that has the ability to adapt to its experiences. So we all have neural plasticity. Now, are there activities that could uh, alter that plasticity or improve that plasticity? Uh, I think there may be a lot of hype in this area, but it's not entirely clear, you know, how to how to separate that from you know, core features. But as I mentioned, the, if you realize that your brain has the ability to be plastic, be adaptable to its experiences, to its environment, um, then you might start being a little selective about what you expose your brain to. What, what images do you expose your brain to? What sounds do you expose your brain to? What thoughts do you expose your brain to? What foods, what's, what chemicals uh, do you expose your brain to all because of the these brain have... can change exactly exactly and so um so I, I don't know if there's particular ways to enhance plasticity i'm not sure if there's strong evidence for that but what i would say is we all have plasticity so we should be aware of that and actually be somewhat selective with uh what we expose our brains to knowing that that's going to change our brains uh, through this attribute of plasticity Sure. So just going off that, um, if we're, if we've got individuals who are trying to reinforce positive behaviors, whether it's kind of, um, you know, work related motivation, focus, <clears throat> or just general things about their own health, um, in for that, are you saying that the environment or the exposure that you have is a method to kind of build that into your system? to develop these kind of habits and how would you compare that to um, those individuals for example you know in school we see some people excelling more than others in terms of you know um, academia or in certain subjects so how does that link in there where's the the differentiation there uh, this is a great topic and i think it, it hits on so many different uh, elements i mean first you consider that in in islamic teaching Mankind is being described as being uh, made of clay, right? And there's many ways you can understand that, many ways you can interpret that. But one interpretation is that clay is moldable, right? And so mankind has a moldable nature. What does that mean? A moldable nature in scientific terminology is plasticity of neural circuits, <laughs> which is exactly what we're talking about here. And so this is a fundamental attribute that Allah Ta'ala has created us with, and it has so many um, elements to it. Now, the way we can think about this is that, um, and we can all, we've all experienced this in different ways, uh, anytime we try to do something new, 
initially it's very difficult, right? But if we develop a habit to do it, it actually becomes much, much easier to do. And that's a, that's a practical example of neuroplasticity. And it can be anything when you're in a new city. Just to, just to kind of uh, open that up a bit more, why is it hard? Why, why isn't it easy? Yeah, I mean, uh, the basic explanation is that initially your brain is not used to that new behavior. And so this applies to everything. If, if you're in a new city and you're trying to navigate where to go in that city to get a cup of coffee, or if you're learning a new sport and you take, you know, let's say basketball, you take a free throw for the first time, you know, the sequence of movements, the sequence of thoughts that's required for either of those actions is novel to the brain when it first starts. But through plasticity, actually, the brain gets um, more accustomed to those patterns, whether it's a pattern of how a city is organized or the pattern of how to you know, shoot a free throw, that over time, it becomes easier for the brain to process that information. Uh, and that's what you notice that, okay, now you can shoot a free throw without thinking about the discrete steps, or you can walk to your favorite coffee shop without having to pull up Google Maps and you know find the directions because your brain has actually learned those sequence of actions uh, in a way um, that doesn't require your active effort. And so those are examples of plasticity. And, uh, you know, so th- these are elements that kind of we see in our uh, daily experience. And in terms of... Um, you know, how, how, what are the influences of that? Certainly there are factors that influence uh, the plasticity of our brains in a particular direction or another direction. Um, And one example that I think is relevant to this discussion is, for example, the environment that we're in and the people that we're surrounded with. In Islam, we're taught that you should have company of the righteous. And that's because Islam, Islam, Allah Ta'ala, who created our brains, understands that there's an intimate relationship between our environments and our brain. And actually the environment influences our plasticity and it influences our behaviors uh, in ways that we may not even notice. But that's an example of how, you know, there are features of our environment that influence our plasticity and they can be in a good way or they could be in a bad way. Uh, it all depends on kind of uh, how we how we make those choices. Just a um, just a quick sort of question off that. So, is that element of neuroplasticity? Are you able to maintain that? I, I'm thinking more in terms of sort of everyday tasks or individuals who want to do something good. For example, the aspect of five daily prayers. Um, we see that in Islam that these are prescribed. So, going according to that kind of theory, the, if you start doing the prayers initially, it may be difficult. But as you go through the years, it should get easier. But are you able to maintain that and sort of applying that to other things as well, not just praying? I mean, sort of good sort of daily motivation, good structure in your day, these sorts of elements. So are you able to maintain that neuroplasticity? And are there certain factors or influences that can cause you to maintain them better? Yeah, I mean, when you think when you think of plasticity again as a fundamental feature of the nervous system and of the brain, then you know uh, it's a feature that I that you know there's some evidence that is that it's particularly strong early on, and perhaps it tapers off a bit as we get older, uh, and you know younger younger people can pick up new topics, new activities, new skills a bit rapidly. That may be harder to do when you're older. And so there there is, uh, I think, precedent for plasticity decreasing with time. But, you know, I think the most important thing that we can do to maintain this fundamental uh, part of our brain is is to use it. And, And the way that you can use this uh, attribute is is just by experiencing new things, keeping your brain engaged in activities. Um, And uh, and again, being kind of uh, thoughtful about which activities you want to um, engage with. Uh, But, you know, just being active, physically active, mentally active, spiritually active, all of those activities activate different parts of your brain. Uh, and and I think that activity is linked with you know maintaining plasticity over time. I think 
so I just want to jump um, further into this subject because there's this whole issue going around with everyone pretty much of a lack of focus, not being productive, procrastinating. What advice would you give and what practical steps would you advise for people to take? Um, you know, we have this whole culture where you wake up and the first thing you check is Twitter or Instagram. Um, and, you know, I'm sure that's not good for your brain. Um, and there's, you know, people getting in that kind of um, state where they can't get out of this rut, where they're just addicted to their phones or addicted to screens. We have children who are addicted to screens. So how, what would be like a good detox, if you like, to start off with if someone really wants to get back on track and make their brain um you know the most optimal for work focus and productivity well so i think there's a lot of ways to kind of approach that but you know i have an interesting perspective on this i i truly feel that allah created our brain and in some ways the teachings of islam and amadiyat are a blueprint for how you can train your brain to operate optimally and so if you look at the teachings of Islam through that light, everything actually begins to take a uh, different significance. Um, when you think about what are the activities that Islam teaches that you should do or not do, and how might that influence your neural circuits, you begin to see a lot of links. Um, so if you take as a fundamental thing, you know, Hazur has... Uh, been asked similar questions recently and this week with Hazur, and he gives uh, amazing answers. First, he says that first and foremost, you can take an account of how you're spending your time, right? You should actually physically write down that you did this from this time to this time, this from this time to this time. And then you can get a sense for how much time you're spending on various activities. I think that accounting, it would be a strong starting point uh, for assessing how we're spending our time and what is helping us or hurting us from focusing. But then next, I would say, what's the, what's the number one thing Hazur always emphasizes? It's five daily prayers, right? And so if you format your day around five daily prayers rather than the other way around, it completely shifts your day. And it has it shifts your day in a way that almost certainly has neurobiological consequences. You know, first and foremost, you would start your day very early with Fajr prayer, and then you would end your day not too late, you know, after Isha prayer. So that shift, I think, would be a shift um, relative to what most people do in, in terms of their daily schedules. And that already has a significant impact. Uh, I think there's a lot of things that, you know, scientists and even the media are understanding with time that uh, help us understand kind of the wisdom of these Islamic teachings. But, you know, it's very commonly thought that uh, you can focus more in the morning and that perhaps people are less productive at night. You know, that's that's an anecdotal experience we've all had. It, and it pertains not only to our productivity, it pertains to our adherence to a healthy diet. You know, it's easier to eat healthy in the morning. It's much harder to eat healthy if you're up Definitely. late at night. After a long days. Uh, exactly, work. exactly. So if you imagine, if you format your day in that way, it would transform uh, your productivity. It would transform uh, your habits, including your diet, perhaps. Maybe you would have more time for physical activity exercise if you if you started with it at the beginning of the day. Um, and then, again, it gives you a different lens that, okay, this is not just the teachings of Islam, but this is actually a way that I can optimize my own, not only my own brain, but my own existence. You can optimize your productivity, your relationships, your happiness, uh, through these sorts of changes. So I think those are kind of some, um, some ideas that I, that I would have. First, you could take an account of your time, and then you could really try to format your day around your religious you know, practices, religious beliefs, in our case, five daily prayers, and then see how that changes things. He see how that changes your perspective. Uh, and then, of course, I think, you know, you have to kind of be um, 
critical in the evaluation of, of why you're doing different activities. Another, so as, you know, as far as five daily prayers are concerned, it's very common these days that people talk about the benefits of meditation. People talk about the benefits of quiet time. I mean, that's what five daily prayers is doing in addition to the more direct spiritual benefits that we believe prayer has beyond meditation. But, you know, that's what that sort of activity brings to your uh, daily routine. I mean, it's a huge break, isn't it? Where, whatever you're doing, if you're a doctor, um, if you're working in catering, it doesn't matter. It's a massive break from your um, daily routine where there's the only really sensory information is just, you know, you and you praying. There's no screens. There's um, you're not looking around. You're even focusing on one one place. So I think it's really interesting you mentioned that um, to breaking up your day around those five daily prayers. Of course, religiously and um, you know where prayers has its main benefits, where where we pray to God, but also for our brain, it's 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 a great rest. Absolutely, and and I think it's not only that your brain gets rest in those periods of time, but actually going to that spiritual river five times a day completely changes your perspective, right? I mean, we're, we are, we are caught up in a, you know, tornado of information, media, you know, current events, things related to our job, things related to our personal lives. We're just consumed by all of this information. But if we break that up and recenter, refocus on who we are, what's important, what are we trying to do, what is our relationship with God, that actually changes not only your mindset, you know, for those few minutes, but it can actually have a broader effect on how you, you know, engage with all of the other information you're dealing with the rest of the time. And what, you know, what's your mindset, what's your attitude as you then go back to your job, back to your family, uh, back to, you know, current events and, and try to understand them and process them. Uh, I mean, this is such a huge sort of thing. Uh, myself and Fatih, we were discussing earlier whilst we were researching and we were looking at things like even like the Google CEO, he turns to this thing called non-sleep deep rest, which is sort of a form of meditation slash semi kind of um, shut down from from kind of his, his work and, and sort of turns to these kind of avenues. So we see that this is such a current thing and it's entirely relevant in, in today's day and age. So, um, you know, the fact that Islam, a religion, you know, established 1400 years ago already has prescribed this in the, the daily kind of lifestyle of um, of its followers is, is such a big thing. Um, absolutely, absolutely. And again, it, it just stems from the fact that if God created us, God created our brains. So he knows exactly what we need to function optimally for our brains. And that's what these teachings are. And, and a fo a one component of how our brains function is how our brains connect with God and how our brains connect with our fellow man and how that influences, you know, our, the spiritual side of our existence. Uh, so all of, you know, we believe that all of these teachings are important, not only for optimal spiritual development, but optimal physical and mental development as well. Yeah, 100 percent. And I think this element that you're bringing in of perspective on life and your outlook on life is so important because in all the other kind of popular science discussions, if you like, of brain optimization, there's this aspect of how to focus better or how to um, be more productive. But the element of reflecting on your life five times a day it's it's you know it's a really good aspect to look at because it does change the way it does change your brain like you're describing but it also changes changes the way you act and your habits as well so i think that's really really powerful um as well just kind of um moving on from this but of course staying on the subject in terms of your own personal kind of um, inspiration from Islamic teachings as a neurosurgeon, as a neuroscientist. You s spoke about how the Quran mentions that we created man from clay and um, this could refer also to neuroplasticity. What kind of other inspirations do you get from the Quran? And of course, we believe the Quran to have profound meanings. It doesn't just have one basic meaning, but 
it reveals itself in every age, in every time, in every circumstance. So what what kind of motivations have you had by reading the Quran as a neuroscientist? Well, you know, I think I think when you read the Holy Quran or you listen to Hazur, um, as we were talking about, you know, similar to the effect of prayer, it can it, it can give you a specific thought or it can actually just change your perspective in a more global sense. And it, it kind of focuses your mind in a different way. So I think for me, um, reading the Holy Quran has had that effect of kind of just changing my broader perspective, my broader uh, thought process. But then there are, of course, particular verses that you that you know you come across that have uh, significance um, that might relate more directly to what you're trying to do or you know what you want to do. I remember when I was young, I had a chance to um, read a little bit more of about the writings of, from Professor Abdul Salam, and you know it was interesting that one of the inspirations that he derived from the Holy Quran was that the Holy Quran basically uh, asks believers to reflect on nature, you know, and this, this kind of um, uh, recommendation uh, occurs at many points in the Holy Quran. And so his interpretation of that was that reflection on God's creation, reflection on nature is a way to uh, not only get closer to God, but the implementation of that reflection is really scientific research uh, in its in its uh, most pure form. Scientists, their job is to reflect on nature. Their job is to learn more about God's creation. And uh, that's not only to uh, increase our appreciation for that, but also to think about ways that that could benefit mankind. And so learning his perspective on those verses you know, was interesting to me because it, it uh, led me to think more about pursuing a career in research. And then we've seen our beloved Azur, he's also emphasized uh, the importance of research. Again, uh, similarly, thinking about how we have a responsibility to reflect on uh, God's creation uh, for the benefit of mankind. So that's been influential. And then as I've gone about my research, I've been able to see connections between what I'm doing and, um, you know, what is in the Holy Quran. So for example, uh, it's very interesting. The promise of Sayyid al-Islam, he, he has actually written that, um, that the physical and spiritual systems of man are governed by the same laws of nature, you know? And when I read that, that, that was really uh, shocking to me because, uh, it suggested that there was a direct parallel between how God talks about spiritual systems and how physical systems may uh, actually be developed. And, and so as I reflected on this further, I started thinking about um, those experiments that I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the podcast in which Hubel and Weasel looked at uh, the development of the visual system. And I saw that, you know, what basically... They, they discovered certain principles of how uh, the visual system uh, develops. And, you know, those, those systems of development were actually um, outlined, if you think about it, in some ways, they're outlined by the Holy Quran when the Holy Quran talks about the development of spiritual vision. So, you know, the Holy Quran talks about spiritual vision in a very interesting way. Uh, it talks about how... Um, Vision, spiritual vision is actually initially a blessing from Almighty Allah, but that proofs then come to you, and then you have to decide whether you accept those proofs or not. If you don't accept those proofs, then you become blind. So similar to physical vision, if you stop using this faculty, then you actually lose the ability to to see. You lose you lose that ability. So similarly, you're you know whether it's a spiritual sense and you become blind, or even a physical sense. As Hubel and Weasel won the Nobel Prize for this discovery, when they stop when an animal stops using its sense, it actually loses it. And then similarly, um, Hubel, Hubel and Weasel discovered that if that occurs in a particular context it can become a permanent condition. And that's how uh, the Holy Quran describes this as well, that, you know, in Surah Al-Baqarah, for example, we learn that 
those who have disbelieved, whether you warn them or warn them not, they will not believe. And over their eyes is a covering. So it's really described in this way that it's a permanent condition. Uh, and that's exactly what we see in, in the physical sense. So there's so many parallels like this uh, that are very interesting to uncover. Um, and again, we're just now learning more about the physical world. And I'm sure as we learn more and more, uh, you know, we're going to get <laughs> increasing understanding for the parallels that exist between the physical world and the spiritual world and the treasures that exist in the Holy Quran that uh, actually shed light on these things. Do, do you get this feeling of when you're doing your research and like you're saying, there's so much being uncovered in the realm of science. Do you get that uh, on a personal level? Do you get this feeling that there's, you know, there's so much in the Quran, which we haven't tapped into um, from an academic perspective, not just the, you know, a scientific research or um, a, you know, scientists find a discovery and then we, it kind of gets confirmed, oh, the Quran said this, but the other way around where the Quran has said something and there's so much scope for Muslim scientists, researchers to take that piece of information and actually see, let's see if this is, you know, it, this is leading us to a scientific fact or discovery. Absolutely. Absolutely. And again, it, it's, it all depends on your perspective. You know, if someone doesn't believe in, in the Holy Quran as a divine scripture, they may think, well, this is just a book that was written, you know, centuries ago. And so they, they discount its relevance. But if you consider that this book, we believe, was revealed by God, who's the Lord of the worlds, who created man, created the brain, created the brain that not only governs all the biological principles that we're talking about, but actually governs how brains interact in society and what rules and regulations can lead to a peaceful society through kind of the understanding of that neuroscience, right? If God created our neural circuits, he knows what rules and regulations are critical for us to coexist peacefully and actually live in harmony together. Uh, and then you start wondering, well, wait a minute, we see around us so many challenges in society, and certainly there's no shortage uh, right now. And and we see, well, what are the what are the things that led to that, right? And what are the what are the things that actually, again, the same God that created our brains taught us 1,400 years ago for how we can, uh, you know, live in a peaceful manner. What are those principles that we're following or not following? And how do we, you know, what are the outcomes of of those actions in society that we see. I mean, it's, it's just a different perspective, you know, basically, you know, rather than thinking of it as an, you know, an outdated book, book, God forbid, it's actually the, it's almost the um, cheat code for understanding, you know, the brain and understanding society and understanding, you know, how, how we can uh, actually improve ourselves, improve society as a whole. And so the the opportunities to understand that are endless, right? Because it was it was uh, revealed by the entity that created our brains, that created societies, uh, created everything, created the universe, you know, which is way beyond even our current understanding. Uh, so there's certainly uh, innumerable treasures there to be uncovered and to, un to be understood. Uh, no, it's absolutely fascinating. Um, so j just coming towards the end, I just want to touch on this aspect of how linked is the the spirituality or this aspect of the soul with the brain. And there are, in, for, for example, there are individuals who put forward the argument that actually there is no soul. Um, there's no such thing as a soul. It's all kind of part of the brain. Um, there has been evidence and research which shows that individuals who pray develop certain portions of the brain. So, for example, the medial prefrontal frontal cortex or sort of the mid front and sort of back portions of the brain develop further. Um, but then individuals who, for example, have surgery due to trauma or disease, they have portions of their brain removed. And yet we we don't see a deficiency in their spirituality or their soul so just kind of trying trying to get an understanding of this how it how linked is the soul to the brain and the development of these brain circuits 
So I, I, I think this is a, a great question, a very interesting question, and, and one that I think we're uh, still at the infancy of understanding. Um, I think part of it depends on how you define a soul, right? What is a soul? But, um, you know, I think however it's defined, most people would probably agree that uh, it's, you know, it's some sort of um, emergent property of the brain uh, that exists within our um, being in some ways, but it may not be physically located in any location. And although that sounds difficult to grasp, it's actually very similar to um, many other uh, things that relate to the nervous system. For example, we don't know, we, we don't know that um, a property of the nervous system, such as memory, is necessarily stored in one location. You know, you can't say that, oh, this memory from your childhood is stored in this part of your brain. We know that there are certain parts of the brain that play a critical role in memory, and there may be uh, parts of the brain that play a critical role in spirituality, but it's likely something that involves uh, all of our brain or many parts of our brain rather than one specific location. And when you reflect on spiritual experiences, you begin to see how that might be the case, right? What are some aspects of spiritual experiences? Well, one aspect of spiritual experience is the emotional component. You may have, as part of a spiritual experience or a part of a prayer, you may have hope or you may have fear or you may have regret or remorse. These are emotions that are governed by these, you know, the, the corresponding circuits within the brain. But, you know, some people with their spiritual experiences, they may experience uh, sensory experiences as well. They may have a memory. They may have a vision. They may hear, you know, um, uh, as part of their spiritual experience, something, you know. And so in that way, you're engaging those parts of your brain as well. The visual system is very different than the part of the brain that it experiences emotion. is very different than the part of the brain that experiences sound or hearing. So spiritual experiences, I think, again, are really a manifestation or an emergent property of the nervous system as a whole. And uh, in some ways, this relates to how Hajjal Kifta Musi Rabi Ramulala talked about uh, the development of man as a way to, uh, the way he described it was that man's development is uh, can be thought of as a way to increase our consciousness right? And so there may be organisms, animals that have lower levels of consciousness, such that maybe they're more engaged with the here and now, they're engaged with basic tasks of survival. But then as you go towards humans, you can see behaviors exhibited in animals and certainly in humans that exhibit a greater awareness, a greater level of consciousness. Now, even within mankind, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has explained that there are natural, moral, and spiritual states of mankind, and so man can exist in in either of the, in any of those states. But ultimately, if our goal is to uh, achieve, achieve the peak of our creation or the the peak of what we're uh, capable of, then perhaps we can become spiritual beings. Now, whether we're existing in a natural state, moral state, or spiritual state, we're using the same brain but we're using those neural circuits in a different way. And perhaps the emergent property of the soul is influenced differently depending on which state we're in and how, you know, how our soul uh, is kind of affected by uh, the states that we're in. So ultimately uh, what I would say is it's a long answer, but I, I would say that uh, I think the soul is an emergent property of the entire nervous system that's influenced by the state that we find ourselves in and the state that we kind of strive to be in. Um, and it's not likely to be located in one part of the brain, but it's actually uh, a summation of all of our neural circuits, uh, the, which themselves are a summation of all of our experiences that we've had throughout our lives. I think it's such a, a a difficult sort of topic to talk about, and I think you've done an amazing job in sort of articulating that there. So uh, that's that's absolutely fascinating. Yeah, yeah, it's um, you've clearly thought about this. 
Um, <laughs> well, see, that's the thing. I mean, I, again, we're I think uh, we're all familiar with, for example, these states of man that uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam describes in yeah, um, philosophy the philosophy of the teachings of Islam. Of Islam. But but when you approach it as a neuroscientist and, and you, you start thinking about plasticity and you start thinking about the soul, you can see it in a slightly different lens. And it's, it's very exciting to think about these things because, again, we're, we're just better understanding the links uh, between our spiritual understanding of some of these concepts and our scientific understanding of some of these concepts. But ultimately, these concepts are intertwined at a fundamental level. What, what are your views kind of just staying with this subject on this massive piece of news which you know all the news outlets reported on of a man who died and his they they actually recorded what they think is that his whole life flashed before him kind of thing um all of his memories just before his death um what are your views on that i mean you know the quran also says that we've recorded everything um so you know, people speaking about that connection as well, but it's, it was a huge discovery which scientists are talking about right now. Well, so I, I had a chance to look at that report uh, just briefly. And, you know, the reality is we don't have the technology right now to know what brain activity um, corresponds with what sort of subjective experience that a person might be having. We do know that if certain circuits are activated, it may reflect a certain type of experience. So for example, if someone's visual cortex is activated, then presumably he's experiencing some sort of visual phenomenon, whether it's uh, physically being in the act of vision or perhaps uh, in, an, in a dream being able to see something. In either case, you imagine that the visual cortex would be activated, but you don't know exactly what the person is experiencing. You can't say that they're seeing a scene from their childhood or that they're seeing uh, a scene from earlier in the day. We don't have the technology actually to understand that. But you know, if various parts of the brain are activated, as this report is suggesting, uh, you know, it, it does suggest that perhaps there's a subjective experience that that person had uh, as they were passing. Uh, and, you know, people who've had near-death experiences uh, may have, you know, reported something similar. Um, but, you know, the interesting element there is that, uh, you know, I think the, you know, when we think about what's the mechanism of that, um, you know, the brain is tightly regulated by uh, the level of uh, various factors within the brain and within the body. So for example, blood oxygenation levels are critically important. Those are directly re related to the maintenance of normal homeostasis within the brain, maintaining normal levels of glucose, oxygen, ions inside and outside of the brain. If someone is very sick and approaching death, then those systems get dysregulated, and and that can actually cause you know uh, abnormal neural activity, or it can cause patterns of neural activity that you might not normally experience, and perhaps that leads to a subjective experience that um, is similar to what's being described here, or what that others others have reported. Uh, so it's I, I don't I don't rule it out. Uh, but I think it's hard to uh, convincingly state that, you know, someone's life flashed before their uh, before their eyes, you know, where they're seeing kind of a fast forwarded movie of their entire life. You know, it, they could certainly have activation of different parts of their brain that lead the to technology difference. isn't there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Just um, kind of as a finishing off, you know, it's been a brilliant conversation, extremely interesting, and there's lots to um, talk about. And I think we will um, God willing, do a whole episode about Islam, Quranic teachings, and what you've kind of found. Um, but just as a closing uh, question, for the upcoming generation, for the youth, especially for someone who's interested in research or thinks, you know, they're, they're inspired by research, what kind of motivation would you give or, you know, your speech that you would give um, to these youth? Um, who want to go into research or who aren't so sure? Well, I'd say that, you know, research is, I think, um, an incredible field and, and you can approach it uh, either from a spiritual side or an intellectual side. And either way, 
it's an amazing um it's an amazing field that I would uh, hope that everyone would consider from the spiritual standpoint, as I mentioned, it's an opportunity to reflect on God's creation and use that reflection and that understanding to serve mankind. So it's almost as if you're engaging in, uh, you know, a remembrance of God every moment that you're doing it, whether it's kind of explicit or implicit. And so uh, I think it would be, um, it must be viewed as, uh, a meritorious kind of pursuit uh, for anyone who would consider that. And then from an intellectual standpoint, it's really, um, it's really incredible because there's no defined pathway. You know, the entire world has to be understood and much of it, almost all of it is not understood. <laughs> and so whatever someone's interests are, whether it's in the physical sciences or the biological sciences or history or, you know, the, the arts, uh, I think there are things that we have to better understand. And so, uh, you know, if you're interested in, in understanding something, if you're interested in charting your own path towards that understanding and discovering something new and thinking about how that can uh, help others, then research is, is an incredible way to do it. Uh, and, you know, if you pursue it, then if you pursue it, particularly with these uh, intentions, then, you know, you have the prayers of uh, Hazur, you have the prayers of the Khulafa and uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam behind you and, and of course, of the community at large. And so, you know, I, I would hope that those prayer, prayers would propel you to success and uh, you would enjoy the process as well. Dr. Atta, it's been brilliant and may God bless you and thank you very much uh, for joining us. Um, it's been it's been a really good conversation and we can't wait to have you back. Well, thanks so much for the opportunity. Uh, yeah, we, we kind of touched on uh, many different topics yeah. and yeah, yeah, uh, it'd, be great, <laughs> it'd be great to go into them in more detail uh, anytime. Definitely, definitely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Al Hakam Inspire podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. Visit our socials on Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube at Al Hakam Inspire. And of course, subscribe to our YouTube channel and leave your comments there. We would love to hear your feedback and thoughts. So send us an email to inspire at alhakam.org.